Hallelujah. Good morning. Shabbat Shalom. How's all y'all? <laughs> Amen. Amen. Well, I got to tell you, Hayes' uh, message is pretty incredible. He, he basically teach, he taught my message. So. Uh, so I guess we'll go to lunch now. <laughs> Hallelujah. Can't wait. Go Rudy. How exciting. Yeah, I bet it is. I bet it is. <laughs> oh, that's good. Well, the Lord's been speaking to, well, obviously Hayes and me and hopefully a lot of others, but uh, I don't know. For a while, I've been struggling um, quite a bit and probably, man, in the last couple of days, more than more than I can remember in most of my life, you know. Um, just immense, I mean, immense, immense stress and struggle. And, uh, you know, and that always tells me, I mean, I know in my head, it means rush, you're operating in the flesh, you know, every single time I know that consciously. And I'm thinking, you know, the hard part for me is always, well, what am I doing in the flesh? And what am I not, you know, what am I not turning over to you? And it's, I mean, it really is a hard thing. You know, I don't see myself consciously trying to, you know, do what God wants to do, um, but I know I'm s- supposed to be looking at my life saying, okay, what is it that I'm doing where I'm operating in the flesh and I'm not turning it over to God and I'm trying to do it on my own and it's always, always a struggle. I mean, I'm on my knees, I'm crying out, I'm saying, Lord, show me these things. And uh, this week the Lord had to, uh, you know, this is just one area, I know there's probably many more, but this week, you know, God has like been waiting, I think, for years for me to to set some things down and just turn over to him. And this week, God just just about literally had to strong arm me to make me <laughs> put something down, <laughs> you know. And this, so this is what happened. Uh, you know, I had texted Dale and Menor and said, you know, they had actually texted me earlier in the day, maybe on Thursday morning, said, hey, how can we pray for you? And it took later in that day. And I said, well, you know, here's some things that we need prayer for in the community. And, uh, and here's something for me. I'm just... You know, it was one in the afternoon, I think, and I said, pray for me. I'm just now sitting down to begin to think about what on earth I'm supposed to talk about on Shabbat. And I usually spend, by the way, two full days preparing for message. You know, I've, I've shared with you, I am not a gifted speaker. It's not, it's not the gifting God has given to me. You know, I'm like, I'm adequate in, in a lot of areas, but I don't excel at any. I mean, really none, you know. Um, and I've shared with you before that God didn't put me here because I'm like some kind of gifted speaker, you know? And the great part about that is I want people raised up to surpass me. See, if I was put in the position because I'm a great speaker, I would want to make sure nobody surpasses me because then I would be secretly thinking, well, if they get better than me, then I'm going to lose my job or I'm going to lose my position or I'm going to lose whatever because now they're better than me. Ah, so that's the great thing. When God calls you to a ministry, to whatever it is he's called you to, Step into it. Don't think, well, I'm not, a, I'm not good enough at this or I'm not good enough at that. If it's because of your skill or your talents, you're always going to be scared that someone else is going to surpass you. If you're put in that position because God's called you, it has nothing to do with your skill, your qualifications, or your abilities. And in fact, you'll always want people to rise up above you. In fact, your fruit will be the fact that other people rise up you know, to surpass you. And So that's just a great thing about where I'm at. And and I'm always trying to egg people on and say, come up and take the pulpit. You know, I see gifts in a lot of people and I'm always encouraging, come on, you got a message. You got a message yet? Let's let's do something, you know? Because I I know we have a lot of people that that have, you know, that hear from the Lord. And and I mean, everyone hears from the Lord, but a lot of people have gifts in speaking that, you know, are thinking, I don't see the gift either, but, you know, I see it. And uh, and I know you guys do too. So anyway, here I am at uh, Thursday at one o'clock and I text Venora and said, man, I'm just now sitting down to begin to think about what on earth I'm supposed to talk about. You know, and I don't ever approach it as what should I talk about? I approach it as, Lord, what are you doing? What is it you want me to minister? Because it's, they're your people, it's your appointment, it's your time. What do you want from me? And you know, I, I get nothing and, and I'm like, well, I know if you give me nothing, I'm gonna go with what is deepest in my heart that I'm most passionate about and I know what God always does he anoints that you know and and I miss it obviously many times but I do my best and and God does anoint you know he anoints us all when we step out in faith to do what I you know what we think he is calling us to do so Menorah says uh hey why don't you uh head to the hills and just spend time with the Lord maybe the pastor doesn't have a message for us you know and I thought 
I thought about it for a minute, and I just thought, man, that's great. And within a minute or two, I'm weeping. I'm just like, that's all I want. I just want to put all this aside. I just want time with the Lord. Oh, I mean, I literally, I was weeping, you know. And I'm like, that's from God. You know, so I'm like, I'm, I'm instantly packing up my stuff, shutting my computer down, saying, I'm out of here, and I don't care what happens tomorrow. You know, again, I'm not apathetic towards it, just recognizing, you know what, I'm going to keep my priorities in order. It's about God. God can deal with Shabbat, you know. I'll deal with, you know, just my relationship and time with God. So I decided to, I'm going to take my bike. It's just such a nice, you know, weather, and I don't get out very often. And, you know, it took me about a half hour to load up everything I needed. I brought a chair and a little table so I could just plant myself wherever. And, I mean, I was ready. I bought some nice beverages. And, I mean, I had it ready. I was going to have the best time under the sun. So I head up to Reverend's Ridge, and uh, I get up to, you know, I, I bypassed Panorama Point. I went to the campground because I thought, hey, it's a Thursday. The campground will be, you know, half full. We'll find an empty spot somewhere off to the side and just, you know, really relax. First thing I see when I pull into the campground is campground full for all the tent sites, campground full for every one of the, the electric sites, you know, where you have a trailer. I'm just like, there goes that plan. And I thought, well, maybe I can drive in and through and I can find, you know, see something, a nook and cranny and nothing at all. And I'm a little discouraged. I thought, oh, that's okay. I'll go to Panorama Point. So I get up to Panorama Point, which I had passed, you know, five minutes before. <clears throat> and it's like, well, there's a few people around and people picnicking, but I kind of found a place off to the side. And then a family comes and it's just screaming and it's kids. And, and I love kids, but when you're trying to find a place and a way and a time to get alone with just you and God, you know, and you have this vision of just oh, soaking it up with the Lord, I did not have that. I was just disheartened, discouraged. And I just thought, how did I miss that? It just seemed like so from God, you know, it's like, what am I missing? I mean, I thought of everything. I thought, was there a pass something along the way? Is there something on the way back? I mean, what do I do? It looked ominous. I was speaking to the sky and, you know, never a drop. But um, I left. I stayed about an hour and I tried. I mean, I really did. I, I, I tried. And I know if I was probably a better believer, I could do it. You know, I've heard of people in prison that can listen to all kinds of garbage around them and just totally immerse themselves in the Lord and have zero distractions. I'm not there yet. So I was, I left almost in tears, discouraged. I packed my bike back up and I, I started heading back down the hills, looking at every place. Where could I go? Where could I go? Where could I go? And nothing, nothing, nothing. And I thought, well, maybe when I get back in town, at least I'll be closer to home so that if it rains, I'll, you know, be able to skedaddle quickly. And needless to say, I ended up at home because there was not a single thing. You know, I stopped at the park out here. I thought, well, that's the closest thing I can get. I hid behind a tree where I could see the house. And I'm hoping Erica doesn't peek out and see me because then she'll say, hey, what are you doing? You know? And I'm wanting to be left alone, but um, anyway, even that didn't go real well. I mean, I, I basically just sat there and cried uh, in my soup. So I came home just about, I mean, almost despondent or catatonic. I mean, not quite, but I just, I mean, I was in a bad place yesterday. Erica tried to talk to me and encourage me. You know, I'm just like, get out of here. I just need to be by myself. You know, and she was really loving on me and trying to encourage and help. And uh, I did not do well. I just said, get out. I trying to be alone and I'm just so discouraged and, and I just went to bed I just said I'm, I'm done and you know still God you're gonna have to deal with Shabbat because I, I have nothing and I, I don't have any motivation you know I'm just I'm done um, and again it's not not from a place of apathy just from inability I just felt so overwhelmed which again always go back goes back to say we're operating in our own strength because I don't ever 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 see Yeshua at a place where he was exhausted um, uh, spiritually, you know. He, I'm, I think he was probably tired physically because he ministered, ministered, but I don't think his emotions were ever below par. I mean, he was always right on keel, always right where he needed to be, and when it was time to go, he went. Whether or not the people were like, hey, we need more, we need more. He's like, sorry, my time is to move on, or I need to go spend time with the Lord. You know, I know that's the way he lived, and he never found himself in that place where I was in. So anyway, I went to bed just wallowing in my tears and in my soup, still knowing, you know, it's me. It's not God. I always know that it's me. Um, but I just thought, Lord, it's in your hands. I know whatever is tomorrow. You know, I've done a worship package. You know, I quickly put together some music. I thought we'll just sit and just listen to music if we have to, and we'll just, you know, sing Kumbaya is what Erica said. <laughs> <laughs> she was, yes, mocking me. And, uh, but that was, you know, compared to where I was, she was in a good place, you know. <laughs> so I thought it was great. It's like, yeah, touche, Erica won, Russ zero. <laughs> but anyway, I went to bed uh, having a pity party, and my alarm goes off every morning at 3.55. I get up, and I spend time with the Lord, and, 
And I went up and I'm feeling a little bit better this morning and I decided, you know what, I'm just going to spend my time with the Lord. I'm, I don't have an agenda. I don't have a, you know, I'm just, I'm going to pursue the Lord. And the Lord began to speak to me about, you know, something that I should share today, something that was on my heart and, you know, something that had happened before, but I didn't see clearly and the Lord began to open up things to me and, <clears throat> uh, and that's what my message is. Uh, so in, in two hours, I did the message, which, like I said, normally it takes me two days, and it was peaceful all the way through. It was, you know, I, I believe it was totally Lord-led, and, um, and I think generally it is Lord-led. I think he anoints even when I, when I miss things, but this was just night and day compared to what I've been. So like I said, strong, God strong-armed me into forcing me not to take the two days that I normally take. He says, I'm going to whittle you down to Shabbat morning and even then it's not even going to be a stress you're not going to wake up thinking I got to do it I got to do it it's just I'm going to seek the Lord and in that he led me to what he wanted for today because I wasn't concerned I knew I mean I did know I knew that I knew that regardless God is more concerned about what happens here on Shabbat than I am by an infinite measure so I trusted in that I just was thinking you can't use me because I'm just I'm in a bad place <laughs> and that's okay so anyway um what I want to talk about today is the dream that God has given to you, which is a lot of, like I really said, and that's really what Hayes was talking about. You know, when God gives you something, we just have to trust in him. And ultimately, that's what this message is about. Um, and it came about, the, the way God put this message on my heart was, believe it or not, through Bill. Bill got up yesterday, or I'm sorry, last week, seems like yesterday. Bill got up last week and shared this dream. If you weren't here, you missed a great dream. I'm going to share it again, but Bill got to share it last week. Uh, and what he shared was a, a two-part thing. <clears throat> and I received it as like an answer to my prayer, just a confirmation of what God is doing. But I thought, it's just, there's some odd parts that don't make a lot of sense about his dream. What, what was that about? There's more to it than just, a, you know, God encouraging me that, you know, the visions and dreams that he's given to me he's into and that he wants to bring to pass and uh and it kind of been on my heart throughout the week but you know not stressing or struggling about it but just knowing that there's more in this so i'm going to uh share that again i'm just going to read what bill had texted me because that's what he had done he, and he had a little commentary but i'm just going to read it as, as best i can um but bill originally sent me a, an email or a text uh two weeks ago saying hey pray for my sister cindy uh, she has a, f a really bad in foot infection. It's infected bad, and now they're talking amputation. She's been at home, I know, for months and months and months. I mean, that's just devastating when you start talking amputation on a, on a body part. Uh, so Bill texts me saying, hey, pray for my sister, and, um, and certainly I did. And then Bill on, it was Wednesday the 19th, Bill got a revelation when he went to bed. And I'm just going to read the text message that he sent to me because this message today is kind of based on this here. Wednesday, July 19th. Before I went to bed, this is Bill. Before I went to bed last night, the Lord was telling me that I did not need to convince Cindy that God heals. I just had to pray and she would taste and see that he is good. Then I went to bed and had a wild dream. Shema was doing some kind of outreach. People started to get healed. Then they started to get born again and baptized in the spirit almost without us telling them how they came or telling them how and they came to Shema and there wasn't room so they filled your front yard and the street. Someone gave us a big top tent that we set up in the path in the corner of 112th and Sheridan but we overflowed that. Someone else gave us a huge building. The last thing I remember before waking up was we were trying to figure out how to train up enough leaders to minister to so many. Hopefully this confirms what Abba has been speaking to. And it does. That dream encapsulates everything God has spoken to me many, many times. And I, I know Bill doesn't know all the things that, that God gave and God filled in holes that I hadn't yet filled in. So I know that it's a literal dream. You know, timing is always in God's hands. Um, but God confirmed things and gave me more information, things that I really would have needed to know. Uh, and I love it. So anyway, I get this dream, and, or he texts it to me, and I'm praying for Cindy. And then uh, miraculous things happen. Oh, no, I had two questions. That's right. I had two things that stuck out to me. Uh, why did Bill, when he sent that text, why did he include the Cindy part? Uh, I know he wanted to communicate, yes, Cindy's been healed, but you know, for me, it seems like the relevant part, hey, Russ, I had a dream. I think, you know, it'll, you know, it'll minister to you. But it came in these, one thing with two parts. It was connected. Uh, the Cindy part was real. That was in his conscious. 
uh, he, God was speaking to him, gave him really the realization, which is absolutely true. Cindy doesn't need to have faith, Bill does. And Bill just needs to pray and believe in faith that she'll be healed. I mean, how many times did Yeshua pray for someone and never even went to their house? They were healed at the hour he spoke the word, you know? And I believe at the hour that he had that revelation and said, great, it is done, it was done. Um, and so those are the things that stuck out. So Wednesday, Bill has, and he shares that dream. He had it that morning when he woke up. On Shabbat, Bill tells us all about the conversation with God and the dream. On Monday, Cindy is found infection-free. Went to the doctor, the infection's completely gone. Uh, that was absolutely a miracle. What Bill had prayed manifest. And I believe it, it manifest in the instant that he had the belief and he had the faith. It manifests then and there. Monday, she found out from the doctor that, hey, we can't find the infection. The infection is gone. So I believe what God was saying in this two-part thing, uh, that was the waking part, the conscious part, and then the dream was, hey, Russ, this is still a dream for you, but here's the way to bring that to realization. You know, you also need to have faith and you need to believe because that is what I have for you. Right now you're dreaming it, but it's as simple as is what built it, you know. It's believing in faith, by faith, that what I have committed to you and promised you, I'm going to bring the past. <clears throat> so what God showed me, he gives us the desires of our hearts the moment we, in faith, ask and believe. You know, that's scripture. We have to ask and believe that what he says is true. We need to be motivated by love. You know, if our motivation is, hey, I want, I want, I want, we can ask all day long for the smallest of things. God won't give you, you know, a shoe strap if we're asking with the wrong motivation, but he'll give us the world if we're asking with the right motivation, with the right heart, according to his name, his character, his will. And that's the flat out word of God. I believe, believe in the moment that he asked, she was healed. Healing came regardless of Cindy's faith. Whether or not she believed is irrelevant. He believed, and therefore it came to pass. And Hayes said this two or three weeks ago, uh, that God has already given us everything that we need. And that, I believe that is absolutely scriptural. He's already given it to us. We simply, like, like the thing I shared about the warehouse, it's simply because we have failed to ask in faith with a right heart. It's all there. We've just not asked. God says that we are already seated in heavenly places with him. You know, if we're sitting in heavenly places, if we're sitting in the kingdom of heaven on thrones, uh, and everything that he's been given, we are now sharing, we are co-heirs. What is it that we can ask for that we won't receive? I mean, can you imagine Yeshua asking for something and the Father saying, no, thanks for checking. It's not possible. We just need to come alongside what he is doing in alignment with what his working on this earth and it's no different than Yeshua. I mean, if we're asking by the same spirit that knows the mind of God, that knows the mind of Messiah, how could we not receive anything and everything that we're asking for, you know? So Ephesians 2.4 says, but God being rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our transgressions, made us alive together with Christ by the grace you have been saved and raised up with him and seated with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. You know, so the scripture is clear. We're seated there. We're seated with him in heavenly places. We already have every single spiritual blessing. Ephesians 1.3 says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord, Yeshua the Messiah, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. It doesn't say some spiritual blessings, many or even most. It says every every spiritual blessing it's already been given to us already not not future it's it's current actually past tense he's given those things to us yeshua has been given all authority uh, matthew 28 18 yeshua came up and spoke to them saying all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth so if he has all authority and he commissions us to do something we have that authority. He's given us that authority. We're, we're co-heirs with it. He's been given. If he's been given it, we're co-heirs of that. So whatever he's been given, we've been given the same thing, the same authority. We're seated with him. You know, that's his desire. So uh, all authority has been given to him on heaven and on earth. And then the co-heirs is seen here in Romans 8, 14 through 17. 
For all who are being led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons of God. For you have not received a spirit of slavery leading to fear again, but you have received a spirit of adoption as sons by which we cry out, Abba, Father! The Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, heirs also, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, if indeed we suffer with him so that we may also be glorified with him. Galatians 4, 7. Therefore you are no longer a slave but a son, and if a son, then an heir through God. That's past tense. We have been. We're no longer slaves. And remember what the word says. A, a, a master doesn't tell a slave what he's doing. It just says, do this, do that, do this. But a son understands why we're being asked to do this. Here's, what, here's the plan. Here's what we're doing today, Russ. You know, that's why... The Lord put that on my heart that we should be seeking the Lord every day. Father, what are we doing today? How can I come alongside what you're doing? Because I want to be a co-laborer with you. I want to participate in the building of the kingdom of God. And if we sit down as co-laborers, as co-heirs with Yeshua, who is our head, he'll tell us, hey, Russ, this is what we're doing today, you know? And that's, that's something we grow in. You know, I have times I've shared with you, it's like nothing, nothing today, nothing today. But you know what? When we pursue that, we ask, we keep asking, we keep asking, He'll answer. When he sees that we're sincere in that and when we follow through on the things that he gives us to do, he says, you're faithful with a little. I'm going to give you a little more. I'm going to give you a little more. You know, and I know I have not been faithful in little things. I think, did I share my testimony about, yeah, I did, giving the money that I withheld. I had a treasure. Good, I shared that. Okay, maybe I'm not. I, I got to share this. Um, a couple weeks now, it's probably a month ago now, Dale, in one of his, you know, words during praise and worship, <clears throat> Ah, he shared this word. And I can't remember the whole thing, but the part that really stuck out, he said, someone here is holding on to stolen treasure. You know, that was the end of his word. And I'm just like, you know, I wanted to sit back. And uh, I mean, I was convicted like a dagger into the heart, you know. And here's what had happened. Uh, Eric and I went to see Abigail at a dance performance. Uh, it was, I think it was December 3rd of last year. And I was moved. I mean, I heard a testimony about a ministry that was just unbelievable. It was one of the coolest ministries I've ever heard. And uh, all volunteer ran. They, they minister to orphans in, I think it's Uganda. Is that where it was? Yeah. Just powerful, powerful. You know, these uh, homeless, oh, obviously orphans, you know, homeless, you know, just nothing to wear. Uh, Anyway, they're reaching out, trying to find these kids and, and minister to them, take them in, clothe them, and find homes, find families. And I mean, it was just, it moved my heart, you know, and I know it was the Spirit, you know, because in our flesh, you know, we want our money, you know, we don't want to give it away. And I was moved right then and there. And I said in my heart, yes, Lord, I'm going to give to this ministry Lord. today. And so I committed, I'm going to, Lord, I'm giving to that ministry. And I grabbed the forms and it came home with the envelope and uh, put it on my desk. And I'm like, man, I'm going to write this check. And Next day, I'm like, yep, i got to write that check out. And I'm like, oh, i got a you know, phone call here, and I got that there. And a week went by, and I'm like, oh, i got to write that check. You know, and then a month goes by, and it's like, oh, man, we've had a lot of financial hits. Like, I don't know if I can write that check. I'll wait until God blesses us, you know, and get the coffers full again or whatever. And, you know, and then here we come. Uh, I don't know if it was the end of June or July. And, and the Lord had convicted me many times along the way uh, about that. And I just thought, well, yeah, is that the Lord, though? You know, Lord, you know my finances. You know our situation. I mean, you understand that, right? It's not like it was then. I mean, now look what's happened. And, the, you know, anyway, Dale gave that word, and I was, I was daggered in my heart, and I just went to bed just grieved because I'm like, I never told Erica what I had committed in my heart, and I have to do this. Erica's going to want to shoot me. I'm doing it, you know, because I committed to God. And I knew in the end she'd say, fine, you know, you know, it's between you and God. And I tell Erica, and I mean, I'm just like almost in tears. She's like, oh, okay, go ahead and write the check, you know. And the funny thing is, that's all we had in our savings, you know. I mean, we, had not, we have nothing in checking, and that was the last thing we had in our savings account. I mean, we had nothing, you know, which is, that was our last cent. You know, really, it was. Um, but she, with all her heart, said, yeah, go ahead and write the check. I'm just like, and I had prayed, believe me, I had prayed, Lord, soften her heart, Lord, soften her heart, because I got to tell her what, you know, what I did. And it was like, wow, God ministered to my wife. That's amazing. You know, I thought, I'm going to be in the doghouse. He's going to shoot me. And why didn't you talk to me about that? And anyway, lessons, a lot of lessons learned. But uh, that was just a, a godsend. Uh, so I, you know, I followed through and, and kept my commitment by the grace and mercy of God, you know. 
if we don't follow through on the little things God gives us to do, um, we can ask for things and he'll say, hey, you weren't, you said you're gonna do this last thing here. Remember that last thing? You still haven't done that. You know, so when we fail to follow through on anything, God may not sit down with us and have a chit chat, you know, about what we're gonna do today because he's thinking, I can't trust you. I can't give you anything what we're gonna do today because you haven't done the last thing. You know, I mean, the word is clear. If we're not faithful with the small things, he can't entrust us with much. And I wasn't faithful with the small things. So I pray God continues to bring to mind the things that, you know, I have missed uh, and all of us for that matter because his word is true. His word is true. His word is so, so true. So wonderfully, painfully true. You know, it's good. Okay. Simply put, all that Yeshua has been given we have been given. We're joint heirs, we're co-heirs, authority, pr possession, privilege, it all, you know. He's our head, but it's all ours. Um, for it to be manifest, we must also ask in faith and believe. Um, if we ask and don't have faith, if we ask and don't believe, uh, we can just absolutely, absolutely forget it. You know, we just we know God's word on that. Matthew seven seven says, "Ask and it will be given to you. Seek and, will, and you will find. Knock and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives. He who seeks finds. And him who knocks it will be opened. Or what man is there among you who, when he asks his son, for, or when his son asks for a loaf, will he give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish?" He will not give him a snake, will he? If you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father who is in heaven give what is good to those who ask him? And Psalm 34, 37.4 says, Delight yourself in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. We read these all the time, but do we really, really believe it? And I know that I consistently struggle with actually believing it. I think, I think we all do. Um, but it's here, and we've got to get our minds renewed. We've got to read this, believe it, and understand it, and have faith to recognize it's all there. You know, those warehouses are there. Everything, you know, like Hayes said two weeks ago, it's already been given to us. All we, I mean, it was given to us before foundations. Yeshua was, was uh, crucified from before foundations, you know, before. So it's already been done. It's finished. We just need to ask in faith and believe. Now, timing is another thing uh, that is an interesting component of this. Sometimes we'll ask and we don't receive, but it's, it's yet. It's not that you're not going to receive. It's a yet thing. Um, and there's some awesome examples of this in Scripture. Uh, and I, I shared on this maybe a couple weeks ago what God is really, really, really interested in all of us. Uh, he can build the kingdom through anyone. He, he doesn't need, you know... He doesn't really need our help. He just wants to use us. He wants to raise us up. Um, what he's interested in is the growth of our character. He wants to see us at a whole new level. Because if, like I said, if we're not faithful with the little things, how can he give us much? And honestly, the reality is, it goes back to, I didn't trust God. I didn't give that because I didn't trust God. That's really what it comes down to. How can God trust me if I don't trust him? He can't. I mean, it's, it's silly. We need to first trust God and then we can trust, or then he can trust us. You know, it's, it's simple. But God wants to build our character and that's part of it. Totally trusting in the word of God. Totally trusting that what he said, hey, I'm gonna give this to you. We have to believe. We have to walk it out and do it in every uh, way, shape, and form of our lives. And sometimes character, however, takes time to build. <laughs> so that promise he's given you doesn't always come the next day or in the hour that you believe. Some things do. They come in the hour that you ask, even in the minute. You know, we heard, you know, the testimonies of Yeshua. What time did he pray? You know, what time did you meet Yeshua and he prayed? That was the very hour in which he was healed. You know, days later they find out it was at that very hour. It's awesome. Ask David when he was anointed king as a youth, did he receive the crown, you know, the the, 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 the throne that hour, heck no, you know? It was many, many years. Uh, and David, it was very obvious to me that David was a man who knew the Lord, loved the Lord, was passionate for God at that time, but his character needed to be developed more. I mean, look what happened, you know, very shortly after, relatively shortly after when he encounters Goliath. 
He knew God would do it. He didn't, he didn't second guess it. But even then, his character was far from where it needed to be to take the throne of Israel to lead a nation. You know, his, his calling was much higher than where his character was, and his character was probably higher than most people in the land. You know, I mean, no one else was willing to defeat Goliath. Not one person there said, you know what? The God of Israel will defeat this giant. I'll step out and I'll be his man to do this. So he probably had the highest character and integrity and, and intimate knowledge of the Lord than anyone in Israel, but it was by far not enough, you know, because we know what happened in his life for probably 15 years. He was hunted and pursued at least 10 years by Saul, the king, trying to kill him. And yet in that time, he never, you know, we talked about that recently too, not one single time, even when he was apparently given the opportunity to take out his enemy so that he could take the throne, he's like, no way, I will not touch God's anointed, and neither will you, by the way. God will deal with Saul. We will not. We will honor him. We'll respect him. He is God's anointed and we'll walk that out. David's character was tried, tested, and found to be true. And that's what gave David the right to sit on that throne. And God knew that. That's why he was anointed as a youth because God already knew from the end or from the beginning how the end would be with him. Another person was Joseph. Joseph had these dreams. He knew he was going to be in some kind of position that his whole family would be bowing down. Even his parents, I mean, I can't imagine what he must have envisioned in that, but my whole family is going to be bowing to me that, wow, thank you, Lord. I'm going to be in some obviously very high position. I'm sure he couldn't even dreamed or imagined where that would truly take him. But from there, it's only downhill. You know, it wasn't an ascent to, the, to fame or to the throne. It was downhill, upon down a further hill. You know, well, first he gets sold out by his brothers. That's sad enough. You know, or, or hated by his brothers, thrown in the pit threatened to be killed, and then he's sold as a slave. And then he's working as a slave in Egypt in a foreign land, family gone, cut off from everyone his love, his, you know, everyone he loves, his father and his brother Benjamin, the most by a long shot, serving now as a permanent, eternal, forever slave in Egypt. How's he getting out of this one? I mean, you can't get out. That's it. That's his lot in life. He's now a slave. And then along comes Potiphar's wife, he does nothing wrong. I mean, I wish I could say that about any part of my life. He does nothing wrong and he goes downhill further. Now he's in prison. What's he doing there? God's building his character. Because the position, his calling, he wasn't able, not in any of those positions yet. He had to endure that. And then he had to rise up into that place in front of Pharaoh, still humble, not saying, oh, get me out. Guess what Potiphar did? Yeah, you know. He was just, I'm here to serve you. What is it that I can do? Oh, a dream interpretation? I can't even do that. You know, God can. Tell me and God will interpret your dream. Humble, humility, never concerned for himself. He's asking, what is God doing here? God, tell me, what's going on in this situation? What can I do to serve you? What are you doing in this? You know, so anyway, uh, sometimes you get the calling by God, anointed by a prophet of God, publicly even, it's meaningless, it seems, for many, many, many years, but it's because God has a high call on your life and it's not going to come quickly. God wants to develop your character and it's going to take time and a lot of tests. You know, for the Israelites to take the promised land, they were given tests. Will you trust me? You're not going to win the battles in Israel if you can't trust me here where there's no battles. It's just an issue of water. Can you trust me for water? It's an issue of food. Can you trust me that I will feed you? You know, and we know, we know they struggled to do that. In fact, they failed. God, in his grace and mercy, didn't destroy them over that, you know. It's fine, it's fine, we'll get through it. Until they get to the promised land, that's where God said, okay, we're done, next generation, please. Let's head out back to the wilderness, because now for the final time, you still didn't trust me, you still don't believe and you're rejecting my word that I said I'm going to bring you in. I've showed you this. I've showed you that miracle after miracle after miracle in your life. Now you get to go back in the wilderness for 40 years until every last one of you until you're all dead except for Caleb and, and uh, Joshua. Yeah, until Joshua and Caleb. You know, they were the only ones that were going to go back in. Even Moses himself wasn't going to make it. Um, but they had, God had to bring up a new generation who would trust in God, who would rely on him and believe his word. And of course, we know when he gets there, first thing Moses does, right when they're back there, ready to cross, Moses does a big recount. Hey, boys and girls, let's go over this again, okay? He tells the whole story, everything that God did, the miracles and the failures, but showed over and over and over and over God's faithfulness. Now, are you guys ready to go in? Yes, we're ready, you know? 
They were not going to make that mistake again. How much less should we make those mistakes? You know, and, and I know that I still find myself struggling. You know, the Israelites, when we look at them, and I used to, you know, we probably all used to laugh at them going, oh, 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 they couldn't trust God. They couldn't believe after all the miracles. They didn't have the benefit of their testimony. We do, and we still miss the mark. You know, we still fail to trust God in the ways that we should. The testimonies are there. God's faithfulness is shown to be true over and over and over. And when we recount those stories through Moses again, how much more should we believe that whatever it is that God has promised to us, it will come to pass. And it's not going to be because of your goodness, your greatness, uh, and this is the hardest part, because you're of your miserableness, you know, because you're not good enough. In fact, that's what he wants to use. He wants to use your miserableness, you know, so that he'll get the glory. It's like, no, you're not a good warrior. No, you're not a good whatever he doesn't need you to be. He just needs you to trust in him and believe that he will do it in and through you regardless of where you're at or what you're doing. Trust in him and that's what he wants. Uh, Matthew twenty one eighteen says, Now in the morning when he was returning to the city, he became hungry. Seeing a lone fig tree by the road, he came to it and found nothing on it except leaves only. And he said to it, No longer shall there ever be any fruit from you. And at once the fig tree withered. Seeing this, his disciples were amazed and asked, how did the fig tree wither all at once? And Yeshua answered and said to them, truly I say to you, if you have faith and do not doubt, you will not only do what was done to the fig tree, but even if you say to this mountain, be taken up and cast into the sea, it will happen. And some, or and some, yeah, I forgot to do my little, my lines here. Does it say, and some things you ask in prayer, believing you will receive? No, no. Many things you ask in prayer, believing you'll receive. No, most things. No, the scripture is all things you ask in prayer, believing you will receive. It's, it's not some many or most, or it's, it's all. Every single thing you ever ask in prayer, you will receive if you believe. That's it. I mean, it's a very explicit statement. These are words, by the way, that are in red. They're the most believable words of all the scripture, and it's all believable. But it's directly out of the words of Messiah Yeshua. All things that we ask in prayer, believing we shall receive. What is your faith? What is it you've been believing for? What is it you've been waiting on the Lord for? It's yours. You have to believe. It's already been given to you. It may not have been manifest yet, but the scripture is clear. It's already, like Hayes said, it's already been given past tense. That is absolutely a fact. It's absolutely scripture. We just fail in our part. You know, whenever we find problems, contention between scripture and what's happening in our lives, we all know, and if you don't know, I'm going to shock you. It's you. It's not God. God's word is true. So if you're saying, yeah, I don't, you know, believe your word, yeah, the word is true. We are a liar. You know, everything God said is true, but every man is a liar. Yeah. Can we read from Isaiah 44, 7? There's something about what you just say. Read away. But I had it in Spanish, so if somebody wanted to follow me with English. Okay, what's the, what's the scripture again? Isaiah 44, 7. Isaiah 44, 7, okay. ¿Quién es como yo que lo digo, que declaro lo que ha ocurrido desde, a, desde que establecí a mi antiguo pueblo, que expongo ante mí lo que está por venir, que anuncia lo que va a suceder? Bless God, Isaiah 44, verse 7. Who is like me? Let him proclaim and declare it. Yes, let him recount it to me in order. From the time that I established the ancient nation, and let them declare to them the things that are coming, and the events that are going to take place. Amen. That's good. That's awesome, Rudy. Thank you. That's a good word. That's a very good word. Thank you, Father. Okay, we have a little exercise. We're going to take about 15 minutes here, okay? Um, in a minute. We're going we're to do it in about a minute. But here's what I want you to be thinking about right now. I'm going to, in about a couple of minutes, I'm going to ask each of you to clearly identify and verbalize, you know, in your mind, in your, in, your, in your heart, the dream or dreams that God has given to you. What is it that you believe, I just believe God has this for me. I believe this is his word to my heart. Uh, what is it, Lord, 
that you committed to me, that you said, this is what I'm going to bring to pass. And I really believe that every single one of us has a dream in our heart. Every single one of us has unfulfilled dreams. You know, unless your testimony is, yep, I'm all done. God has done everything. I have everything I've ever wanted. God has given me everything that I could ever want, hope, or dream for. If you're that place, praise God. And if not, then this exercise is for you. But identify what is it in your heart that you're testifying that God still wants to do this in my life or God has for me at some point in my life. First thing I'm going to want everyone to do, ask you to do, is repent if you've given up faith. If you've just given up hope, lost hope, you know, like the Israelites, are we ever going to get into the land? Repent. Begin to ask again, now here in faith. Do not doubt, but believe. We have to ask in faith without doubt and believe. And I should have put that scripture that says, if you ask and don't believe, uh, you're like a, 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 you know, a person tossed around in every wave of doctrine. Nothing you say will come to, come to pass. Nothing. Remember what Yeshua said. Even if you say to this mountain, be taken up and cast into the sea, it will happen. You know, we talk in scripture about mountain moving faith, you know, that's a joke. This is mountain flying up off the bottom of the ground, flying up over Utah, Nevada, California, into the Pacific Ocean, moving faith. That's the kind of faith that God wants us to have. You know, it's not this, let's just creep it over here a little bit. That puppy's up and flying. You know, we're talking about Mount Everest gone. If God says that's what we need to do, it will happen. Yeshua could have given a lot of examples of smaller things. This is the example. And we've never seen it before. But if Yeshua says it's true, and I don't think he was giving an analogy, you know, if you ask for big things, it'll come to, I really, literally, literally believe that. If there's a kingdom need for a mountain to be cast up and thrown into the sea, it will happen. You ask it and it will be done. Those are Yeshua's very own words. So I believe that it's absolute truth. So we need to ask, do not doubt, but believe. That's what Yeshua says to do. And there's one more component Found in Mark eleven twenty four. Therefore I say to you, all things for which you pray, ask and believe that you will receive. Uh, believe that you will receive. <sighs> I did this again. I told you I did this this morning in two hours, so I missed a couple things. <laughs> believe that you will receive. The scripture doesn't say that you will receive. It says that you have received them. You know, again, I'm just pointing out that's what Hayes said a couple weeks ago. You have received. That's past tense. Whatever it is that you're asking for, you've already received. You know, look it up, Mark eleven twenty four. Therefore I say to you, all things for which you pray and ask, believe that you have received them and they will be granted you. Whenever you stand praying, forgive if you have anything against anyone so that your Father who is in heaven will also forgive you your transgressions. But if you do not forgive, neither will your Father who is in heaven forgive your transgressions. And that's the other part of this. Forgiveness, you know, that is not just a, a second thing isolated in Scripture that, hey, here's something else I need you to learn. They are connected. If you're asking for something, you better not have unforgiveness towards any soul on this earth or anyone in heaven. You better have uh, a right heart with every soul, with every person, or you can forget about the asking. You get that right. I mean, how many times did Yeshua say, hey, if you got ought against your brother, he's got ought against you? Before you even go to the altar, before you even make a sacrifice, you go back and make it right with your brother. So Yeshua is telling us, search your hearts. If you have aught, bitterness, unforgiveness towards anyone, you've got to put that at the feet of Yeshua and you've got to let it go. Then ask, you know. And that's what I want to take the time to do uh, right here, right now. And this is really important that we do that. We're going to add to that list that we take time to earnestly search our hearts and ask the Lord to reveal anyone that we have bitterness or unforgiveness towards. And if so, we're going to repent about that. We've got to repent. We've got to let it go. And the solution, I'm telling you, the solution always, 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 if you're struggling with someone, the very best thing to do is begin to pray for them. And it may start with a, you know, just words that are you know just coming out mechanically and there's nothing in your heart it's totally at the head level if that's where you're at no problem start there first start by repenting mechanically get those words out and you begin to pray you begin to pray you begin to pray and you don't stop praying until from your heart 
comes words of love. And I'm telling you, I've gone through this many, many times. Before you know it, within minutes usually, you'll begin to be praying for that person. And it, it's not just words anymore. It's pouring out of your heart love for that person. You know, I didn't bring up the scripture, but the scripture says pray for your enemies. And that's why. When you begin to pray for them, God lifts that heaviness, lifts that burden, lifts that unforgiveness right off your heart. It's set at the feet of Yeshua. And now you have a heart that says, man, I love my brother. I love my sister. I let it go. In fact, not only do I let it go, I want the best for them. They're a child of the living God just as I am. God loves them just as much as it does me. Not any more, not any less. He loves them too. You think I've done anything, you know, you think I'm better than that person? Heck no, we're probably worse than the person we're judging. It's, we see the little splinter and we're carrying a log in our eyes, you know. So if we're struggling with someone, do that. Pray, ask God to forgive you for holding that bitterness Begin to pray for that person until out of your heart flows love and passion for that person. Once you've got that right, then say, Lord, what is that dream? What is that vision? What is that word that you've spoken to me? And I'm going to believe now. For the first time, I'm going to believe with all my heart. Because one thing for true, if, if the dream and vision that God's given to you, first of all, if it's something you could do in the natural, it's probably not from God. God wants to be doing something that you're going to be co-laboring with him about. It's something so far beyond you. It's so big. Not to say God doesn't ask us to do little things. He does. Hey, pick up that piece of trash, whatever. Um, but I'm talking about a big dream, a big vision, something that God has put on your heart that is impossible to do in the natural that only he can do. Begin to ask him and believe. Lord, I know you have that for me. I'm going to believe that. So I'm going to begin at this moment and this point in time to trust you believe in faith and it may or may not come tomorrow and if not coming tomorrow or today it's because you have character to work in me and I know the direction that we usually go when you got character work in me we're going to go downhill yeah we're going down but you know what in all of those times our response needs to be though you slay me I will hope in you exactly even if it looks like Joseph even if it looks like David even though it just goes down 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 our hope is in him. And we see that in David. We see that in Joseph. That needs to be our testimony. That needs to be our walk. Because when he puts a high call on your life, it's not going to come overnight. A simple thing, you know, like praying for someone's foot, hey, taken care of, you know, done. God's given you something bigger. It may take a little time. It's not because God is slow. He is not slow. He's working on our character. And we should be saying, wow, the longer it takes, the worse down I go, wow, this is exciting. It must be a really big vision. It must be really bigger than I thought. You know, Joseph wasn't clarified. He was ruler of the biggest nation, the strongest, most powerful nation in, in the world at that time. Second only to Pharaoh by a chariot measure. That's it. In respect to the throne, that's it. He was given everything. No man will lift a hand or set a foot out except by word of Joseph. That's what Pharaoh says. Woo, that's powerful. Daniel was given the same kinds of things, you know, same kind of authority many times over and over. And man, did that poor youth go through serious trials and difficult times in his life. You know, I can't imagine what, what God had promised to him as a youth and then he gets hauled off as a captive in slavery, forced to learn this stuff, forced to be separated from his family, live in this, you know, thing, eat, eat obviously unkosher food that wasn't, wasn't biblical, but he kept hoping in the Lord. He didn't give up. He kept being true to the little teeny things that God gave him to do. I'll be faithful in my diet. I think I can, get, I think I can do this. And, but we just need to be faithful. So I'm going to take some time right now. Literally, I want us to sit, you know, if you need to move your chair or whatever, but sit and get intimate with the Lord. Um, and I'm going to probably play a little bit of background music, but I want us to search our hearts. Do we have bitterness? Do we have unforgiveness? Repent if we've lost faith or given up and begin to ask again in faith. Do not doubt but believe. Yeshua said, even if you say to this mountain, be taken up and cast into the sea, it will happen. And he also said, whenever you stand praying, forgive if you have anything against anyone so that your Father who is in heaven will also forgive you of your transgressions. And that should actually be the very first thing. That bottom one should be the first thing. So start there. Um, and as the Lord leads, just seek this out and believe. I, I just know that God has incredible things for everyone.